This video is titled Modernization in the West and it has two parts. In the first part we're going to look at the question, what were the basic features of the new industrial system created by the Industrial Revolution? And what effects did the new system have on urban life, social classes, family life, and standards of living? In the second video we will be looking at the question, what were the major ideas associated with conservatism, liberalism, nationalism, and socialism? What role did each ideology play in Europe between 1815 and 1900? Let's first talk about the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution began in Great Britain in the late 1700s and spread to Western Europe and the United States by the middle of the 19th century. Seven key changes drove industrialization and contributed to modernization. Number one, the mass production of goods, more and cheaper goods beginning with textiles. Secondly, coal and steam replaced wind, water, and animal power as sources of energy. Third, machines led to new ways of organizing labor. The factory system replaced cottage industry based on the family unit with wage-earning individuals. Fourth, the economy shifted from one centered around agriculture and handicrafts to one based on machines, automation, continual technological innovation. Fifthly, we see a rural to urban migration. More and more people live in and around cities than in the countryside, and rural areas become relatively depopulated, while cities become teeming with thousands, eventually millions of people. Sixth, we have new social classes an industrial middle class, and an industrial working class. And finally, number seven, a changing human relationship with the environment, which you can see in the illustration. The Industrial Revolution began in Great Britain in the 18th century. One might ask, why Great Britain? Why not, for example, China, France, the United States, countries with larger territories and populations, more resources, well, the Industrial Revolution began in Great Britain for a variety of factors, one of which was improvements in agriculture. The fact that Great Britain didn't have a great deal of surplus land meant that in England, and especially, agricultural innovation had been the norm for decades. In other words, people in Great Britain worked harder to grow more food on less land, and eventually became so good at doing this that agricultural innovations led to more food produced by less people. In other words, less labor-intensive methods of agriculture. In a positive sense, this meant more food. Perhaps in a negative sense, it meant unemployment. It meant that people in the countryside had to seek other opportunities to make a living. And those opportunities would ultimately be found in urban areas, in factories. How did factories get started? The first factories were textile mills. And textile mills developed with innovations in textile manufacturing technology. First, the spinning jenny in 1768. As you can see in the illustration, one machine operated by one machine operator could spin numerous spools of thread, something that one person at a spinning wheel used to do rather painstakingly could now be done in a much more rapid um, and productive way. James Hargreaves' invention of the spinning jenny in 1768 had revolutionary implications, particularly when it was eventually accompanied by Edmund Cartwright's power loom. The power loom, which was connected ultimately to a water wheel, invented in 1787, did for weaving of cloth what the spinning jenny had done for the spinning of thread and yarn. We can see the implications of these machines and the factories that were built around them in this statistic. Great Britain imported two and a half million pounds of raw cotton in 1760. By 1787, Great Britain was importing over 20 million ton pounds of cotton a year and in 1840, 366 million. So a veritable explosion of the textile industry. By the way, much of this raw cotton, of course, came from the southern United States. 
There were other important technological changes that accompanied the changes in the textile industry. One of these big innovations was the steam engine, in first invented by a man named James Watt, W-A-T-T, in the 1760s. What looks like a rather large and cumbersome invention in, in machine in this illustration was originally developed for use in pumping water out of coal mines so that mine shafts would not be flooded. But eventually, smaller, more efficient, and powerful steam engines came to be used in factories, such as textile manu manufacturing factories, and eventually for transportation. Most spectacularly, the railroad. The first locomotive steam engine was called the rocket. It was called the rocket because it could travel 16 miles per hour. And the rocket started its inaugural voyage or its inaugural journey in 1830 on the brand new Manchester to Liverpool Railroad. Manchester was a textile manufacturing town. Liverpool, of course, a port. 32 miles long, this was the first railroad in history in 1830. By 1840, Great Britain had gone from 32 miles of railroads to 6,000 miles of railroads. So in just a decade, thousands of miles of iron rails are being strung across the landscape of Great Britain. And within a decade, the locomotive engines could travel almost three times faster than the rocket. With all these trains and rails, we have greatly increased coal and iron production. In fact, by the 1850s, Great Britain produced 3 million tons of iron a year. And in the mid-19th century, the British industrial economy was equal to that of all other nations combined. The Industrial Revolution led to the creation of the factory system. In the factories, we see new aspects of work, such as work discipline, hourly wages, and the presence, the large-scale presence, particularly in the early 19th century, of women and children, who often compose two-thirds of the workforce in the factories. 12 to 16-hour days were typical, and dangerous conditions prevailed in both factories and mines. Labor unions were illegal in the early 19th century, and the reform by government of working conditions only got started in the 1830s. By the mid-19th century, industri industrialization had spread to Western Europe and the United States, as had the social impact of industrialization, in particular, urbanization. Between the 1750s and the 1850s, the European population nearly doubled and the main growth was experienced in urban areas. The city of London went from 1 million people in 1800 to over 3 million in 1850, and by 1850 there were nine other cities over 100,000 in Great Britain. This was spectacular growth, but it was also unplanned growth. The cities of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century were crowded and had poor sanitation. Diseases such as cholera, typhus, ran rampant. The germ theory of disease was not understood in the early to mid-19th century. Only the innovations and discoveries of Pasteur and Koch in the late 19th century would make it clear how germs operated and what public health and sanitation reforms were needed. This era of the Industrial Revolution and the growth of cities also saw the rise of new social classes. An industrial middle class, or bourgeois middle class, or bourgeoisie, including industrialists, engineers, managers, captains of industry, was accompanied also by an industrial working class, also known as the industrial proletariat. Many of the industrial workers were skilled, but there are countless more were unskilled and lived often on subsistence wages. The Industrial Revolution led to an overall rise in living standards as well as patterns of consumption. However, these benefits were not felt 
equally by all people. And increasingly, the problem of poverty was a major part of public discourse and popular culture. The 19th century was not just a time of material growth and material profits, but also philosophical materialism, changes in worldview that were typified by two of the 19th century's most important thinkers, the German Karl Marx and the Englishman Charles Darwin. Karl Marx was a proponent of revolutionary socialism. In 1848, he co-authored a short book called The Communist Manifesto, which broadcast his theory of dialectical materialism, the idea that all change throughout history is based upon conflict and struggle. In particular, Marx stated that the meaning of history was class struggle based on competition for scarce material resources and the oppression of the have-nots by the ruling elite. Marx talked about the industrialized Europe and the world of his era and prophesied the victory of the proletariat over the bourgeoisie, a violent revolution to seize the means of production, which would lead to the in inevitable victory of the working class. Karl Marx's ideas coming out of the Industrial Revolution and also animated by a materialist philosophy of history were was was an inspirational marx's ideas were inspirational for many thousands of people who flocked to the banner of socialism charles darwin was not a social or political or economic thinker but rather a naturalist he had traveled across the pacific ocean on the hms beagle and did research in among other places the galapagos islands in 1859, he published a work called The Origin of the Species, in which he talked about a theory of evolution based on natural selection, an idea which clashed with some people's ideas about a creation of species. Instead, Charles Darwin talked about the random nature of natural selection and the survival of the fittest as animating nature nature which was characterized more by a violent struggle than any kind of harmonious plan. Darwin's theories were controversial in society at the time, but also, perhaps even more importantly, his ideas about nature were eventually appropriated by proponents of what comes to be known as social Darwinism, the idea that competition and struggle aren't just present in nature, but they're present in the human world and the Ideas of strength and domination and cutthroat competition, far from being harsh necessities of life, are actually desirable qualities. Karl Marx and Charles Darwin are only two examples of the philosophical materialism that increasingly prevailed in the 19th century and was accentuated by the Industrial Revolution and its effects. In closing out this first half of the video, I want to draw your attention to two important resources um, that I want you to have a look at. First of all, this NPR story about the doctor who championed hand washing and briefly saved women's lives. His name was Dr. Ignaz Semmelweis, and his story is a very important um, and very timely story, um, albeit something of a tragic one. So please look into that story about the doctor who championed hand washing. I also want you to watch the BBC documentary, The Industrial Revolution, a very informative and evocative, um, less than one hour video documentary that you can find on YouTube. So please look at those two resources and we'll catch up with the second half of this lecture about the ideologies of the 19th century. Take care.